So at the center of the study of human geography is how humans interact with their environment. And this is what we call human environmental interaction. For example, look at me right now interacting with my environment and it's, it's disgusting. But what's crazy is that my family produced all this trash and then I'm gonna roll it down to the street later and some guy in a jumpsuit is gonna take it away. And I'd like to believe that they're gonna take it all to trash heaven where it's gonna spend eternity frolicking in open fields, world without end, amen. But I have a sneaking suspicion that my belief is flawed and that they're actually taking it to a giant nasty landfill and burying it in the ground where it will live until the sun swallows the earth. And that's insane, like we bury our trash in the earth? Well, yeah, that's like kind of the best idea we've had so far, but it's only one illustration of how humans interact with their environments, and that's what this video is all about. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, well, let's get to it. So there are three big categories of human environmental interaction that geographers study, and you need to know all of them. And by the way, if you want notes to follow along with this video and all my videos, check the link in the description. First is humans' use of natural resources, which are materials that are found in the earth that humans use for economic gain. I mean, to be fair, there are probably some resources on the earth which are just useless for humans, but for the most part, we found a way to generate prodigious amounts of boom boom from most of the earth's resources. And within this category, there are two kinds of natural resources. First, you've got renewable resources, which can be used in unlimited measure. For example, the sun is an unlimited resource that humans can use. I mean, scientists tell us it's gonna burn out in like 8 billion years, but we got some time. Anyway, with technologies like solar panels, the sun's energy can be converted into electricity and you can have as much of it as you want. Or wind is another example. Ain't no shortage of wind, and with turbines like these, wind can also be converted into electricity. <laughs> But on the other hand, we've got non-renewable resources, which can be used only in limited measure. Like once these are gone, they're gone. Maybe one of the most important examples here is oil. This sweet black gold is buried under the Earth's surface throughout the world, and we figured out about nine gajillion ways to make money off of this stuff. So not only is oil refined and used to make gasoline for our cars, but its byproducts are used to make plastics and rubber for electronics and basketballs and even your dang toothpaste to only name a few. But the big honking problem here is that the Earth only has so much oil, and when we run out, we're donezo. But don't worry, when we no longer have oil to manufacture toothpaste, apparently some companies are now using charcoal. So, you know, that's... That's an option. Okay, the second major category of human environmental interaction is concerned with sustainability, which is concerned with using renewable resources in a way that they will continue to be available in the future. I mean, if we wanted to, we could use up all the non-renewable resources in our generation and create post-apocalyptic conditions for our children in which societies are ruled by burly men with necklaces filled with the teeth of their enemies, but it's, it's, it's generally frowned upon. No, we wanna make sure that we use resources in such a way that they'll continue to be available in the future. And to accomplish this, it's often governments who make policies regularly the use of those resources. For example, one of the main concerns surrounding sustainability right now is climate change. Since the 18th century, humans have used fossil fuels like coal and oil more and more, and by burning it in our cars and our factories, greenhouse gases are released into the environment. The problem is that those gases trap heat, and the more we hurl those molecules into the air, the hotter the Earth becomes. And the hotter the Earth becomes, the more wildfires occur, the more ice caps melt and raise the sea levels. And that means concerns about climate change have led governments and international coalitions to create policies limiting carbon emissions, which will hopefully mean that the future generations can live on the earth in peace and not, you know, under the domination of Mr. Teeth Necklace. Okay, and the third major category of human environmental interaction geographer study concerns land use, which describes how human beings use and modify the land on which they live. And under this heading, geographers study humans' built environment, which includes everything on a piece of land that humans have built, from Zaxby's to neighborhoods to religious spaces. And what's most important to remember here is that built environments reflect and are affected by the cultural values of the people who build them. For example, the built environment of Washington, D.C. reflects the values of American government. You got three branches of government and three different buildings. And apparently we're big fans of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln. But that looks way different than the built environment of Rio de Janeiro because Brazilians have different cultural values than Americans. And the differences between all the built environments across the world are reflections of various cultural landscapes that people create, and we'll get to that in Unit 3. Okay, so those are the concepts geographers use to study human interaction with their environment. But geographers have also established two frameworks of thought, which is to say theories that helps them get all thinky-thinky about explaining those interactions, and you need to know both. The first theory is called environmental determinism, which argues that a people's environment determines the shape of their culture. Now, determinism was the dominant theory in the 19th and early 20th centuries during the European Age of Imperialism, which is to say the age when Europeans colonized nearly the whole dang world and called all the shots. And this theory helped them justify 
that global takeover, and here's why. In tropical regions around the equator, food is relatively easy to grow because the climate is warm and precipitation is abundant. Therefore, Europeans, thinking along the lines of determinism, concluded that tropical cultures must be pretty lazy and underdeveloped. So hey, let's go take them over and show them how great Western culture is. <laughs> rude. Yes, very rude indeed. But here's where I tell you that determinism is no longer the prevailing theory. Today, possibilism is the dominant theory of human environmental interaction, and it argues the reverse, namely that humans, not geography, are the main determiner of their culture. In other words, possibilism says that whatever environment humans find themselves in, it offers many different possibilities for cultural development. Now, to be clear, possibilism isn't arguing that environment has no effect on cultural development because it obviously does. It's only arguing that environment isn't the main determiner of human culture. However, it's important to understand that a people's possibilities for shaping their environment are related to their access to various technologies. So for cultures with access to many technologies, their environment plays less of a role in how their culture is formed. And for those with less access, environment plays much more of a role. All right, well, I'm getting out of this trash can. Click over here to keep watching Unit 1 videos and also over here to get my video note guides. If you don't like reading your textbook, you still need to get the content of the course, like the video note guides are the way to go. Anyway, I'll catch you on the flip-flop. Timler out. Whew.